So we're just about ready to move into the section on analytic methods for evaluating limits. And uh, those methods rely primarily on a number of properties, algebraic properties for limits, uh, which are stated at the beginning of that section. Um, there aren't any arguments in favor of most of these given in the textbook, and this is typical of most calculus textbooks. We, we take these rules um, for granted, or, or we, we take them as being sort of intuitive or obvious, but you can in fact establish these as, as theorems. You can prove that these are true, and the way you prove them is to use the formal definition of the limit. Uh, since we've just gotten some practice working with that formal definition, I thought it might be worthwhile to see how you use it to establish a few of these basic facts. We'll do these easy ones, we'll do one that's a little bit more challenging, and we'll convince ourselves that with enough effort, or maybe by looking things up in, in a more advanced textbook, we might find proofs for all of the other properties. Um, but we'll start with a few just so you can get a feel for, for how this goes, right? Um, now, in the first one, in the first one there's really nothing to do, uh, because given, given epsilon greater than zero, right? Uh, so here, you know, your function is just a constant function, right? So basically this is saying that the limit of any constant function is that constant. So f of x minus k, well, that's the absolute value of k minus k, but that's zero, right? And zero is more or less by definition less than epsilon, right? That's part of the definition. Epsilon has to be bigger than zero, right? Um, so any delta will do, right? This is probably the easiest epsilon delta proof you'll ever do, right? Um, some people may want to distinguish here between the fact that uh, this k here we're thinking of as a constant function, whereas over here we're just thinking of it as a value, as a real number. Um, generally, we don't really worry too much about making this distinction. Okay. Now, uh, the next one, uh, we just have the identity function, right? So, so here, f of x, f of x equals x. Okay. And we say, okay, well, how are we going to make this one work? Well. Given epsilon greater than zero, what do we need? We need a delta. And what do we need? Well, we need to know that if x minus c is less than delta in absolute value, then f of x minus c, we want to show that's less than epsilon, right? But f of x is x. So we want that to be less than epsilon, right? So what should our delta be? Well, let's see, let's look at this, let's look at that, and it um, looks to me like we should probably take delta equal to epsilon, right? Um, then this is basically tautological, right? If, 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 if the absolute value of x minus c is less than epsilon, then the absolute value of x minus c is less than epsilon, right? Nothing to it. Of course, the, the statement over here, if you kind of read it out loud, this also seems like a tautology, right? It's saying, well, if x is approaching c, then x is approaching c. Again, yes, clear. Uh, Although there is a sort of a subtle difference between the two x's, right? In that here, this x is an input for a function. It just happens that this function produces an output that's identical to the input. Uh, nonetheless, it's essentially a tautology. All right. Uh, now, uh, for the last one, given epsilon greater than zero, well, let's see. I'm going to just leave this here. We'll fill in the blank in a second, right? I'm going to tell you what delta needs to be. Um, so if the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, then, well, the absolute value of kx minus kc, oh, well, 
that the absolute value of k times x minus c, that's the absolute value of k times the absolute value of x minus c. Okay? Um, so what should we choose for our delta? We want this to be less than, than epsilon. We know this part is, is less than delta. So let's take delta to be epsilon divided by the absolute value of k. Right? Then absolute value of k times this will be less than absolute value of k times delta, which is epsilon. One catch, of course. This is going to fail if k is 0. But if k is 0, then k times x is 0. 0 is a constant, and you're back in part A.